This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. Aloha and welcome to Talk Story with John Waihe. For those of us that are that enjoy the football season, the last few years, actually that's a couple of years, we've seen something ha interesting happening on the field. Uh, we've seen people like the quarterback uh, Kaepernick, I think his name is from the uh, formerly of the uh, San Francisco 49ers, Neil doing the uh, playing of the uh, national anthem. And yesterday, and then we've seen our president comment on those kinds of antics. And yesterday we saw entire teams take a stand uh, and use the moment of this national anthem as an opportunity to say something. And it seemed to me, for many of us, we really would like to understand how this process works, you know? And, um, and it's all part of our guaranteed freedoms in this respect. The United States Constitution guarantees us freedom of speech and freedom of the press, freedom of religion, all of many things. And I thought it would be interesting to sort of explore this uh, very current uh, phenomenon. And so this afternoon I have with me Hawaii's, probably Hawaii's foremost First Amendment attorney. And uh, I've known uh, Jeff Portnoy for a number of years. In fact, uh, it's very possible he might have even sued me a couple of times for my involvement with the uh, First Amendment. So I, I, I appreciate your, your coming on the show, Jay, Jeff, and, and uh, discussing this issue with us. Well, thank you, John. I probably did sue you a few times. <laughs> Well, we're not going you wouldn't to, be the only governor. You know, I and, and, and here's the strange thing about your suits, though, which you ought to know. Back then, I, I would have. I know I we defended it vigorously, but now that I've left office and moved on, and in this current age, I, I really hope I lost. Well, you were one of the more. Uh, I would say, you know, we all know about your efforts to pass Hawaii Chapter 92. So. Going back over the last five governors, I think uh, you were the most aggressive in trying to promote access, at least to government yeah, meetings. Uh, and you know, and, and I think we need that more than ever, more than ever. I agree. But also, just the f what's interesting now is it seems like the exercise, the, what we take for granted, of, free, of uh, saying things that we believe in, doing things that we believe in, have uh, come under attack, or at least they're being... You know. Well, I mean, this whole thing with the National Football League and now the NBA, it's, it's really kind of unfortunate in one respect in that these are sporting events. Right. And they're being translated into political events. And I, I think there's a issue as to whether, as the result of the president weighing in now in the last 48 hours and team owners now responding and the public kind of torn. We've kind of messed up, I think, the distinction between what should be a football or a basketball game and what are clearly the athletes' free speech rights to protest in any way they think is appropriate. And uh, Colin Kaepernick, as you pointed out, started this a year ago. And then because of the political reaction to it, it's just encouraged literally hundreds of other athletes to take a stand. Well, you know, just getting down to the basics, though, it seems to me like when you say, the, when you use the word free speech, you say something. And in these cases, it seems like, but then uh, we realize that there's an element of free speech that has to do with symbolism. Yeah, speech can be symbolic, and, and the United States Supreme Court has made that clear. The Tinker case where a high school kid wore a peace armband and got expelled, went to the United States Supreme Court, they reversed that conviction or... In other the words, they say that... He, he, you don't have to use words. Speech can be symbolic. It could be a sign. It could be an armband. Uh, it could be a number of things that express a point of view. But in that, the Tinker case, it was a youngster that was being disciplined by his school because what he, his symbol, in a sense, right. did not uh, meet the dress code. 
Well, that was their argument. That was their argument. That, yeah. that was their. But it, what the what the Supreme Court ruled was that that symbolic gesture was protected. Right, and what these athletes are doing, I mean, many of them were speaking out, but what they do is, for some reason, the national anthem, which is an interesting side discussion as to why, why the national anthem is being played at the athletic events. They don't play God Save the Queen at the <laughs> in soccer games in England. You know, they don't play the German national anthem, I don't believe. So, you know, we have this tradition of playing the national anthem before sporting events, and it's a legitimate question as to why you even do that. But having done it for decades, there are now athletes who believe that they want to express their uh, concern about certain political issues in one way they know is going to get millions attention. of people's attention, and that is to either sit during the national anthem or yesterday not even come out of the locker room. Right. And, and, and so the, the point, though, is that the ability that it's uh, freedom of speech is more than just words. Right. It's, it's, it's conduct, it's gesture. Now, what, in my opinion, uh, would ma made yesterday interesting or, or make the current situation interesting is the fact that we have uh, one branch of our government, the President of the United States, um, in uh, talking about the incident, which is okay. I mean, uh, I mean, how far, how how far does a person like the president? Uh, how much latitude does he have with freedom of speech? Well, he's got plenty, but I mean, you know, he should have not gotten involved in. Oh, this. that's a should. You know, I mean, you know, saying that uh, the owner should fire these athletes and. But it's typical Trump. I mean, you know, he has a small base of 30% of the people who probably agree with him 100%. Yeah. And I think he forgets that he's president of the entire United States. And he's he's just a government, actually. He's just aggravated the entire situation, and now you see the reaction. The reaction yesterday, there are only a couple of athletes who were kneeling or whatever during the national anthem until yesterday. Then entire teams in reaction to Trump, not in reaction to police brutality or whatever Kaepernick was originally protesting. That wasn't a protest the last 24 hours. That's not why LeBron James went after the president. It's because the president is weighing in. A lot of people think it's racist. A lot of people think it's inappropriate. But 30% of the people are probably cheering him for well, working on these I athletes. Think, I, think the, I think you just described the politics uh, very well. With the, with the situation, but I was uh, uh, looking at it from another point of view, where you have a branch of government, in a sense, dampening political expression. Well, you know, and the president yeah. comes out and says, "You ought to fire this person." He's not dampening anything; he's ratcheting it up, and and I think but, that's but, what he doesn't realize. But if somebody actually got fired, well, and they came you know, to see. Jeff Portnoy, and they said he well there's interfered a question. with my freedom of speech. Yeah, but, you know, John, the Constitution only applies to government. I mean, uh, uh, it applies to government. It doesn't apply to private people. I but mean, is the president a private person or the government? He probably has immunity, unfortunately. Well, for the lawsuit, <laughs> yeah. But, but what you have is here. What you have is a... The government of the United States, or at least a branch of the government, uh, talking about uh, people's, um, uh, not, not in a way of saying, like, I disagree with you. Right. I disagree with you. I don't think you're getting anywhere with this. But saying you ought to be fired. Your well, job you ought know, to be taken it's away. It's toothless. But, I mean, we have a century of jurisprudence where... City councils, state legislatures have tried to make certain speech illegal. It goes back to World War I, and it continued up until even today. <laughs> and many times, most times, the Supreme Court will say that speech in and of itself, you cannot prohibit. There are certain types of speech which aren't protected. Pornography, for example. Uh, certain types of commercial speech have a limited type of protection. But when it comes to political or social issues, the court has repeatedly found that ordinances overbroad, 
or unconstitutional, with some rare exceptions, because they're based a lot on the political times. In World War I, they convicted a, a bunch of people for treason, for making statements about America's entry into the war. We saw it right. with the communists in the early 50s. Fortunately, we have a court that has been able to say, no, speech well, is protected. During the Vietnam era. Unless it's era, inciting people to violence, by right, the way. Right, right. Uh, well, let's, let's get clear on that. Because, well, just before I left that, but the, in, during the Vietnam era, the, uh, the Supreme Court upheld the idea that one could even burn the American flag. That's right. Which many people felt found disgusting. Well, and a couple of justices did too, but still upheld the right of a person to do that. Right. And so in this case, if you're not standing for the national anthem, it seems to me... Well, like first of all, I mean, without getting too philosophical, who says you have to stand for the national anthem? Where is that? Start with. Where is that in the uh, Constitution or in statutes? Yes. It's just tradition that people... Who says you got to put your hand over your heart? Well, yeah, you know, yeah. a lot of people still do. A lot of people don't. Uh, you know, I mean, these are just things that, that have occurred. Or as custom. Yeah. So there's no law that says well, you have to I, stand. I, I, that would be interesting, John, if the, some... Some state would pass a law that you have to stand for the national anthem. Yeah, obviously. And then somebody said, no way, I'm sitting. Well, I, I, one of these <laughs> days, you know, I, I, I don't know. I, I, I don't know if he's done it yet. But it seems to me that at some point uh, the president needs to understand that he is a branch of government. Well, you know, that's not going to happen. And he... <laughs> you <laughs> know that as well as Somebody I do. might be doing it. Okay, so <laughs> having covered some of that, right. what are the... what? What's, what's protected and what's not? Well, I mean, you can't, as I just said, you can't end somebody to violence. I mean, you know, speech only goes so far. You, you, there's a fine line, first of all, between speech and action, all right? But even speech that could incite violence can be, on occasion and under the appropriate narrow ordinance, couldn't be, could be prohibited. Uh, but we see that even that is who, who determines whether... It's inciting violence. Is it the speaker or is it the listener? And we saw this in Charlottesville. Right. The, the city did not give the permit for the uh, Nazis and the Klan to march, claiming that they could not protect the people that might otherwise want to counter-demonstrate. The court said no. You know, you have police powers. You can separate people. You cannot stop people from exercising their free speech rights, no matter how repugnant Right. That conduct is. But if someone said, let's go shoot the president, they'd probably be arrested and they would not get off on free speech. They're inciting someone to violence. To but if I hold up a Nazi flag in a Jewish community, am I inciting people to violence? Well, the court said no in the Skokie case. Yeah, the court I, said no. You had to allow so the plan to march. what's the difference? I mean, at it's, what point does something turn into... Or is there a difference between free speech and hate speech? Well, that's the latest kind of debate. Okay. Uh, the hate speech argument is gaining acceptance in college campuses, uh, in some other places, that any kind of speech that demeans women or minorities or gays should be prohibited. That's the whole political correctness thing. You know, I just have to say that I don't agree with that. I don't think words can hurt. And if words hurt, just give words back. So I, I've always been a proponent, even when they thought at University of Hawaii a decade ago of maybe putting in a speech code, I advised the president at that time, privately, don't do it. It's supposed to be a place where ideas are communicated. And Even people, ideas that are repulsive. Right, and people came back to me and said, well, you, you know, you're a white male. You don't know what it means to be this or that. And I said, you're right, I'm a white male, but I believe in speech. I don't think speech should be censored. Well, I, I by, remember by some when group. the uh, free speech movement began. In Berkeley. In Berkeley. Sure, and, look at it now. and the word was, you know, just the F word right across sure. the chest. Sure, and, uh, and And most of the people that were espousing what would be considered at least controversial speech, or out of uh, were, were uh, from the, um, I guess you would call them progressive or the lefts today. We're, we're going to be taking a short break, and we're coming right back for this very interesting conversation, and uh, we're going to talk more about 
what is appropriate and what is not regarding the uh, free speech debate. All right, let's do Thank it. You. This is Think Tech Hawaii, raising public awareness. Ted Rawson here, folks, your host on Where the Drone Leads, our weekly show at noon on Thursdays here on Think Tech. Aloha, my name is Mark Shklov. I am the host of Think Tech Hawaii's Law Across the Sea. Law Across the Sea comes on every other Monday at 11 a.m. Please join us. I like to bring in guests that talk about all types of things that come across the sea to Hawaii. Not just law, love, people, ideas, history. Please join us for Law Across the Sea. Aloha. Guys, don't forget to check me out right here, the Prince of Investing. I'm your host, Prince Dykes. Each and every Tuesdays at 11 a.m. Hawaii time, I'm going to be right here. Stop by here from some of the best investment minds across the globe and real estate, finances, stocks, hedge funds, managers, all that great stuff. Thank you. Welcome back to Talk Story with John Waihe. Our special guest today is First Amendment attorney Jeffrey Portnoy, our, actually our legal expert on the, on the First Amendment. By the way, if anyone has any questions, call us at 808-374-2014. Jeff, we were just talking about the idea of, of hate speech and freedom of the speech and and the controversy that universities are following uh, all over the nation, or finding all over the nation with, by speakers coming in and now from the left, as opposed from the Berkeley types, which carry the F word on their chest. Now we're having people instead talking about uh, things that are, are hateful. And uh, p universities are, are trying to stop them from doing that. What? How would you distinguish, if you tried, as an attorney, between speech that would be considered hateful and something that would be considered just a matter of opinion? In your opinion, any speech is free. The problem with that, and it's a good question, is it's in the eye of the beholder. I mean, uh, what's hateful speech to you may not be hateful to me. It could be political, uh, it could be social. That's the problem these days, and, and uh, I don't know where it's going to lead. John. Well, let, 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 uh, well, neither do you know, I, but let's say uh, pornography. The Supreme Court said that oh, no you, when you see it, yeah. you'll know it. Right. So it's totally subjective. Right. And that's one standard. But there's also, in law school, I, I remember the, the, there was a standard. And, well, there's a the time, standard. place, and manner standard. That's right. And it well. was that you're not supposed to yell fire in a crowded theater. Well, you can't defame somebody. That's not protected speech. You can't make false statements about people. Uh, so what's the difference between... Well, the fire in the theater is, in, you know, is, is creating a situation. But it's an objective standard. It's creating a situation in which... You may be uh, causing some action to occur that is damaging. Mm -hmm. Said, you know, let's go shoot the president. Or fire in a theater and people then start to riot and people get injured or killed. But the problem these days is that there is a vocal minority of people, and on the left, which is very, very curious, who want to ban any speech which they find offensive which they to the have listener, to establish which they the find offensive to the listener All right and i think that is a slippery slope that our country for 240 years has tried hard not to permit it's still speech right i know there are people you could have on this show that will tell you that speech can be as hurtful as a right cross to the chin. But in my view, it's simply speech, and people should be able to express their views with certain limitations, and we've talked about a couple of them. But just because it's hateful to me is well, how much, not the appropriate how test. Much, um, 
how much does, I, I can, uh, well, some one of the arguments would be, okay, we're both two private parties. You say what you like, I say what I like. We, uh, if we go gets carried away, we duke it out or whatever, we end up being processed, blah, blah, blah. But go does government participation in a forum that allows hate speech to occur, does that make government the underwriter of that speech? For well, example, if the University of Hawaii was to invite the leader of the Ku Klux Klan. Well, they wouldn't. The university wouldn't do it, but some student group might. And they would like to use uh, taxpayers' facilities to, to hold it. You know, that, Does yeah, that make a difference? It's the same argument about, you know, having someone speak at Ala Moana Park and knowing there's going to be a counter demonstration. That's what the police are for. I mean, you know... Uh, well, that's in terms of protection. What I'm talking about more in... Using well, the words of the First Amendment, is that um, establishing something? Is that, is that in some way endorsing it? No, because I think the law has made it pretty clear to governments, whether they be city councils or state governments or Congress, that in order to pass any kind of law or ordinance that is going to attempt to restrict speech, it has to be very narrowly drawn. It's going to undergo strict scrutiny. I don't want to get legal here, but the government is going to have a very difficult burden in trying to establish. So the establish... government can't just say you can't use my facility. No, you're going to have to. You're going to have a very difficult time okay. convincing a court so that's that one... there was a significant reason to limit someone's speech rights. No. And they've carved out various classifications: defamation, pornography, some types of commercial speech. Things that are directed to kids, the so-called vice so you can't, cases. You can't, you can't have a meeting of uh, pornographers of America. You probably could. You probably could, right? Unless they <laughs> try to show some pornography. Uh, unless they actually they show might, pictures. Yeah, and then they might get, uh, uh, you know, they might get. Uh, you know, it, it's so tough because it, uh, you, you, one of the reason why I'm asking this line of questioning. Okay, we we got that pretty much. I, I think, uh, uh, established. What, now we get to the press, okay, and, 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 and the freedom of speech, part of the corollary of that uh, uh, is obviously the freedom to, be, to re be able to report things and the freedom to say things. And I can understand, just glossing, the difference between the state, uh, star advertiser and uh, what's the name? Bright Bot? Bright Bot? But, you know, I mean, one is obviously very much an opinion piece, but they're both covered by what I would consider the freedom of speech. Again, going back to government's action in all of this, all right? I, you know, it seems to me that there is something challenging to the First Amendment when the President of the United States can um, favor news sources. See, it's one thing to allow newspapers to say anything they want, but I am in competition. I'm in competition well, as a business, and I need to survive as a this business. This president's made it pretty clear that he has media that he trusts and media that he hates. Talks about fake news. He's banned reporters from Air Force One if he doesn't like stories. I mean, we are in a we are in an era that challenges the First Amendment. We are in an opinion. era never before really seen, uh, with a president that is so outwardly hostile to the media. His comments about the New York Times, the Washington Post, CNN, is hurtful and hateful. But no, but yeah, comments. He's entitled to it, even though he's comments are not one, very presidential. Let me yeah, put it that way. Comments are one thing. Well, they're not doing, you know, they haven't done anything yet. I no, mean, but when, they might prosecute reporters for source issues. So did Obama. Obama's administration oh, might have yeah, been okay. the most anti-media when it came to prosecuting or attempting to prosecute media for leaks. That's a different issue. But, you know, we don't have criminal libel anymore. That was the government's effort to do what you're talking about, to try to impinge on... The press. No, I think, I think I think there. I, I, I and uh, and uh, by the way, I agree with with you. We shouldn't have that kind of libel, you know. 
But what I'm talking about is something a little bit more subtle, and that is that media, whether we like it or not, what we consider to be media today are businesses. There are important businesses mm -hmm. because they're carrying out an important mission, but they are businesses. They well, need to be able to survive. Yeah, but actually, John, a lot of people would say media today is something we've never seen because of the Internet. There are bloggers. They're not businesses. They don't charge. No, I mean, but what happens when... A but I agree with you that most of the mainstream media are, are businesses. Are businesses. And so what happens when government... When a branch of government says, I'm not taking any reporters with me on this trip to XYZ, but I'm going to call back Fox News and tell them what happened. Now, what that does is that it chooses winners and losers. Well, and it delegitimizes the press. I mean, you know, presidents have always, governors have always had issues with the press, but it's always been at a level that is essentially civil. It's not anymore. I mean, this president is out to destroy anyone who doesn't agree with him, whether it's well, I think, a I newspaper think, yeah, or a politician right. or an NFL football player. And all this country can hope is that it survives the next two plus years. Or is does he and cross replace the line? Him. At what of course point he crosses does he, the line, but he's not doing anything illegal. No, at what point does it become illegal? At what point does government sponsorship of the press of any press affect the freedom of it? Well, I, mean, I don't think the government sponsors the press very much. I mean, the press is kind of independent. It, it, it kind of weaves its way through things and tries to overcome. Well, I, I, hope, you, I hope so, but it seems like he, when you choose somebody to give news to, you pretty much... But you can't help that, John. But, I mean, and okay. there are some access cases. I won a case here against Frank Fossey. Exactly. Where, where he come? banned the Star Bulletin. Oh, from right. Press now we're talking about... I See, won that in case Hawaii, in, what's the, uh, in Hawaii, what we had was... Uh, I remember Richard Barreca. That's exactly right. Barreca, that's a, and he that's got that's kicked out of the... Uh, right. And you took the case. Right. Now, what that did was it made sure that everybody had equal access. Not that it changed Frank's opinion of Richard and Well, we won that under, you know, the state constitution is, can be broader than the federal constitution. I don't see the Washington Post suing, I don't think they have, to uh, force the president to put one of their reporters on Air Force One. But it, it's not a good environment. I mean, I, I'm teaching at the law school now. I'm teaching constitutional law, teaching speech. This is a fascinating but very disturbing time I wish we for had. those of I, us who believe in speech. And, you know, one justice, one more justice on the court, things and who could knows? change. Who knows what will happen? Change. It's very spooky. Yep. And I'm, I'm really sorry we don't have enough time to That's get all to the, money religious, the religious aspects of freedom of the speech and how that's starting to clash. Yeah. I, I'd hope to de go do that. But Next Jeff, time. I want to tell you, I, we've got to have you back. Thanks, John. It, it's very, it was very it. interesting. Thank you. Thank you. Aloha, everyone. Join us again for Talk Story with John Waihe.